Hi, everybody. My name is Marty from Revex, an Apple company. Um, thanks for having me here today. Um, as you see, I'm also in London. Oh, just kidding. I'm actually in Singapore. So I was just going to say to James, what you have definitely in common is the nice uh, big wheel in the background that we also have in Singapore. I don't know if anybody has seen uh, Captain America's shield here recently. It's a very nice uh, uh, ad that was being brought up by Disney Plus for the launch. So yes, yeah, so, uh, thanks a lot for having me. We'll be talking about engagement and retention with programmatic in the post IDFA era. And uh, uh, let me just straight away dive into it. First of all, uh, just to warm up a little bit and also to tell you more about myself. So I actually have a very warm relationship with London, very fond memories, because I actually moved there in 99 to study and I spent like five years living in the city and enjoying all sides of it. So I thought I, I share a little bit with you guys. I mean, this was my university, Holloway Road, basically. That's where I landed in an eight square meter dorm in 1999 to discover London. Um, and I never looked back afterwards. Then this was my favorite club, The Fridge, unfortunately closed in 2010. That's where we spent most of our Friday nights. And I mean, who wouldn't miss the London Underground, right? Especially during rush hour. Um, still a place with a lot of memories, uh, although not so liked. And then of course, there are other bizarre things bizarre things that are happening in the city which make it very memorable all right so uh, after telling you a little bit about my relationship to london so i guess thanks again for for having us here today um, i would like to spend two three minutes on explaining who revex is so uh, revex um, is an apple company uh, founded 2014 um, became part of the apple group in 2019 has always been engaged in programmatic for initially for retargeting also the last two three years um, heavily investing into user acquisition and rolling out this product with more and more success. We have currently nine offices, uh, most of them in Asia, and uh, we are uh, opening offices in Europe, in the US and in Latin very soon. So if anybody here is seeing this and would like to engage with us because we're hiring, please let us know after the session. Um, what we do is pretty straightforward. I mean, we take care of uh, everything around uh, basically acquisition and engagement of users. So it's a full funnel solution. We take care of creative innovation, real-time targeting, placement optimization, CPA, CPI prediction. So it's really everything you want to have in a one-stop shop platform in programmatic to acquire as well as engage users. And then, I mean, you've seen us maybe somewhere in, in uh, because of awards or in some rankings. So you can find us also there. Um, and see how we've been performing in the past. So um, just before we dive into the content, I would like to tell you what uh, the content is going to be about. So you can actually uh, structure your expectations as well. So first of all, I would like to take a step back and give you a historical perspective about advertising, because when we talk about engagement and retention, um, this is really about understanding advertising and the power of advertising. I think without understanding this, we might get lost a lot in technology and in data and in specs, et cetera. And I think you've had a lot of sessions about that in the last few days. So I want to take you out there, take a step back, gain perspective before you dive back into it and make decisions about how you can drive more efficient advertising in the future. Then um, I'll address the impact on iOS on the existing advertising landscape as much as this is possible, because effectively we haven't seen the full impact yet, or we're going to see it very shortly, most likely, if Apple continues to roll out 14.5 with ATT as expected. And then we're going to look at measurement options, because anything that you have learned about measurement options in the device ID world will not work anymore in the non-device ID world. So I think we have to address this because that will determine how you allocate budgets in the future and how you structure your campaigns. And then we'll look into audience engagement targeting strategies that you might want to deploy in the future for the non-device ID world. All right, Paul, James already mentioned, please don't miss the Paul. Um, I would like to use the, your input later on uh, in one of the chapters. So please uh, give your input there. Right, gaining a historical perspective about advertising. I think many of you do not know this guy. Um, he's been pretty famous in the past. Uh, his name is Bill Bernbach, um, one of the founders of DDB. And he said, 100 years from now, the idea is still going to be more important than all the technology in the world. And uh, you'll see later on that this, this has actually some truth to it, yeah, because ultimately technology is there to deliver 
and basically to make uh, to spread the idea right so if you think about like looking into the past and thinking about newspapers for example yeah very famous medium right before actually radio and television came up and i mean i'm not sure how many of you have bought a newspaper in the last five years i can't remember the last time i bought one so this has been a very traditional medium actually and the way how newspapers or print itself basically was being sold in the past and i'm sure that this is also something not many of you have seen is actually by uh, analyzing the readership so you had the demographics you had some information about for example um their uh, um, household incomes you know female white black etc cetera, etc cetera, all types of demographic information that could be useful for targeting yeah but the targeting would work like this that you would say okay i allocate a certain amount of my budget to that channel because that channel is addressing that demography so we're spreading it let's say for, uh, if you had an editor that had like 10 20 magazines with which the editor tries to cover all sorts of demographics you would go there and depending on what type of products you are try trying to promote you would allocate your budgets accordingly across these print magazines yeah so this is how it was basically in the past it looks pretty manual and we're sort of like uh going back uh, going a little bit back to that world um so uh how did advertising actually develop so i mentioned print already then radio television so something like mass media was coming up right addressing like broad broader audiences and then of course to uh, drill down on smaller audiences you had something like special interest media or special interest print yeah or in television you had certain prime time and then you had certain shows that were addressing certain audiences again so this is the way how actually marketeers were trying to address the audiences and segment them and actually put their messages out to attract uh, users to buy the products and services they were advertising and then the digital age came and then we are we were moving pretty fast into something that we could call one-to-one -one marketing yeah where basically uh, the groups of users that I was uh, addressing would get smaller and smaller and smaller until it gets uh, until it's a one-to-one -one relationship namely the device ID and accordingly the way how we run campaigns has changed as well it's not so much anymore about creativity it's more about like scaling a campaign going out there in certain volumes and finding users and showing them ads yeah sometimes good sometimes not so good ads so what happens of course i mean if you see this development what what has happened inevitably is the consumer became at some point unhappy and they were striking back yeah? they were saying okay i mean i'm seeing ads here i'm seeing ads there everything is full of ads yeah how do i get rid of these ads because i'm actually only interested in the content right um so the ad blocker um became famous yeah some people were using it and suddenly there was a growth from 2013 2014 onwards and um basically ad blockers were blocking the ads on behalf of the users and sometimes they would be whitelisting publishers if publishers paid yeah so this became a huge conversation about whether this is eth ethical cor ethically correct right i mean but then the ad blockers were saying well we're just protecting the users etc so it was a bit of a fourth and back but it was quite a disruption because of course many publishers were living from monetization through ads because content was in the internet always free right and this is also something that maybe the newer generations new generations grew up with free content right if you think far back i mean content had to be purchased right you were purchasing a new newspaper purchasing a magazine etc so things were not free but with the free internet and the free content advertising was the fuel and uh, now other things came up like gdpr ccpa to basically make sure privacy is being protected. And of course, all of this was uh, is a jeopardy for uh, advertising revenues because everything was focused on distribution of ads en masse, right? To, uh, into a one-to-one -one relationship, right? Then the next thing was the cookies, cookies deprecation, Safari announced it, um, some stock market, uh, some stock listed ad tech companies lost 20, 30% value after this announcement because it became clear that of course, the one-to-one -one targeting for advertising would become less efficient right and then finally we have arrived to ios 14 which is kind of like today or now where apple says okay i'm going to protect my users uh, in terms of privacy from uh, being tracked across different apps so i'm basically breaking down breaking down on this one-to-one -one relationship and i make sure that users can choose yeah so making the idfa an opt-in versus uh, uh, something that by default uh, is available or something that users have to find and then switch on switch off for the whole device right so 
once this rolls out, and we still don't know exactly when it's going to roll out, I mean, we do all types of bets. Is it like end of March? Is it beginning of April? Is it maybe not rolling out with iOS 14.5 because somehow the industry is still not ready, supply is not ready, MMPs are still changing things, advertisers are scrambling. So we don't know exactly when it's going to roll out, but when it rolls out, what will it do? Um, we don't know yet for sure, but what we know is the following. Uh, what can happen? Mobile ad spend 2020 looked roughly like this. So 250 billion. And then if we split this by OS, you see it's roughly 50-50. So what here is in question is actually this proportion of what has been spent last year. Will this be spent the same way or will it be spent differently or will, will advertisers even spend more? Because ultimately behind iOS devices, I have users that I want to address, I have users I want to acquire, that I want to re-engage, where I want to do branding campaigns to be top of mind. So all of this persists, right? What stops to persist is the mechanics that have been used to actually address these users, right? And that money that you see there was being spent based on these existing mechanisms. While when we look at Android, where the majority of users is available on a uh, deterministic basis through a device ID, we can probably expect that this amount will just rise, but uh, the techniques and the ways how the money is being spent on Android is probably going to be roughly the same. How does it look like when we look at a global landscape in terms of markets? Yeah, so I just drew this up in terms of showing, okay, these markets are actually large markets and they have a larger iOS proportion. So you can now make some numbers and understand uh, also in relation to the previous slide, uh, which markets are impacted. So let's say if, if you're an advertiser that advertises a lot in these markets, then you will have to rethink a lot how you spend your budget. Versus if you're advertising in those markets that I've just uh, put in with um, the white background, then there the iOS population is rather smaller. Um, and maybe there you can still operate mostly in your old ways and kind of wait a little bit how you, how you see how the industry is dealing with this challenge and which type of methodology you want to adapt in order to allocate your budgets. So how do we need to look at measurement options? I was mentioning before already, um, the way how you were measuring before will not work in the device ID less world, right? So one proposition could be, um, okay, let's make users opt in, right? The whole thing uh, rolls out and then actually, which is probably, or let's say we could say it is an advantage. Users are not anymore becoming LAT on the entire device. Now it's going to be selective app by app, yeah? So you could think, hey, a good app gets consent and a good app that is for, for some reason not worth the consent does not get consent, yeah? So how do I actually explain this now to the user suddenly to say, hey, you know, you are able to give consent, yeah? And please give me consent. Now we know that Apple has this ATT prompt um, there's an idea circulating, well, it's not just not a new idea, uh, but something that might become very valuable is so, sort of to say, okay, if I do user acquisition, yeah, so I uh, attract a new user for an install, then basically the UA ad directs the user first to an M web page where the value proposition is being explained. We all know, I mean, how often we have opted in with WhatsApp, with Google Maps, with all types of services, because we knew hey, they need our location data or they need whatever other data, they need access to my address book because otherwise I can't connect with my friends. So anytime we had a choice to make, most of us, or probably all of us, because we're all using messengers, have opted in, right? So it's a matter of value that we perceive uh, that we get when we opt in versus trading it with my privacy, which is my address book, right? Which is, I think, very valuable to all of us, right? We just give up my address book and Telegram, WhatsApp, Signal, everybody has it, no? So yes, we are ready to do this, but we need to understand the value. And a mobile web page that is in between before redirecting to the app store could help making this value proposition visible to the user. Then uh, what is this? Well, this is just the prompt that basically would make, make, make most people according to surveys opt out, right? I mean, tracking, tracking cross apps. Okay, this doesn't explain me a value proposition, but this is coming up if I do not have any chance to explain the value proposition. This is what is coming up and uh, survey shows like 80, 90% of, of, of uh, asked people would say, okay, I'm opting out. Then we're losing basically the ability to track deterministically. Yeah? What Google is, has been talking about is the sandbox. Yeah, this is a more probabilistic approach where users are not any more available one-to-one, -one, but you're grouping users into audiences that then should be valuable for advertisers. So it's not any more one-to-one, but it's also not mass media. It's, it's more like groups of interests. Yeah? So Google has 
is, is pursuing a bit of a more friendly approach. But what we know from this is that ultimately um, we're going to be somewhere between campaigns where we can apply deterministic tracking and others where we can apply something like probabilistic tracking. It's going to be a mix. Now, this, of course, you've seen the last days and also the last months and weeks, etc. I mean, as SCAD network, what I want to say here, I mean, this is like, I call it SCAD 1.0. Um, maybe it's already 1.1 because there have been iterations made, but the whole thing is really, really complicated. You, know, you look at the flow. I mean, everybody has learned in the meantime what, how this works, but it is just not what we are used to use when we think about the, uh, the MMPs that are now dominating the ecosystem, providing services that are very advanced. So I call this like back to the future, right? It's something like we're going like five, six years back in development of a measurement through an MMP. Apple monopolizes basically the MMP space. Yeah, it says, hey, you are just using my MMP and I'm forwarding data to everybody, but it's a system that is sort of not ready. This is something you've seen as well. I mean, there's some data that is being sent back with the post back. And what is very valuable here is the conversion value. I want to know exactly what the user was converting on. And um, the problem here is that uh, I can determine, I can define a lot of conversion values. So everybody can, every app can define their own conversion values. We know this, this is 63. We know if a user moves up the hierarchy of conversions into this for from one stage into the next stage, the attribution window resets to kind of like 24 hours. Yeah, so the, the time that you can get actually um, information yeah, is, is, can be very, very long, yeah, depending on how you define this list. Yeah? And ultimately this leads to a lot of confusion. Right. I mean, so you have to understand how SCAD network works. Everybody has to register there. It's monopolizing the space. Yeah, you have to rely only on one source of truth. And then you have to configure all your events. Yeah. So this is highly, highly difficult. So I think everybody uh, and that shows also in the in the readiness of the entire industry, let it be supply, let it be any other attack player. Nobody's fully ready. That means if this thing rolls out immediately, scale is a problem. Right. So uh, I think uh, I would say until I call it this confusion settles. And until Apple also is improving the system is probably taking another six to 12 months, right? And in the meantime, we have another problem here, which is fraud, right? So I'm just listing down like five very basic, basic mechanisms, how to prevent fraud. There are many, many more, right? But the complexity of SK Ad network basically opens the door widely to fraud, right? Fraud from the supply side, but also fraud from the vendor side, because ultimately the advertiser is left with less data points they can leverage, yeah? And of course, um, for example, these two that are dependent on device ID. So only with a device ID and with timely measurement of events, I can actually um, optimize for post-install engagement or understand whether there is actually no action after the install, right? Because it's a fraudulent user or non-existing user or databases, I, databases I have created to actually list device IDs which are fraudulent, I cannot use that either. So I'm losing actually uh, out on fraud prevention. And that means the likelihood that advertisers are losing budgets because of fraud is actually increasing with a new way how uh, Apple uh, is implementing and imposing SK Ad Network. Yeah? So what are we left with ultimately? Or um, what do we have to do? Well, what I said before is, well, traditional uplift tests don't work in LIT because they're all dependent on device ID. There was a control group and a test group basically uh, regardless whether it's intent to treat, placebo ads, ghost bits, ghost ads, everything was dependent on device IDs to determine who falls into which group and how I would act actually measure the performance of, uh, of each of these groups. Yeah, So all of this, what you've learned in the past, doesn't work anymore. What works is something that is not new at all, but it hasn't been applied at scale to advertising yet. Yeah, At least I haven't heard from any advertiser that they're doing it. Um, which is something like econometric time series analysis. Yeah, um, what it does is simply um, over time. So this is like a GDP per capita analysis, for example. So you see, there's a, like like de decades of years, basically, yeah, where basically different countries were being tracked, and then uh, you can do this as in historical analysis to say, okay, I see a dip here in the treatment group. What happened to the treatment group and what did not happen to the control groups? Okay, this has been the fact that it actually impacted that decline or increase in the curve basically. Yeah? So what you do is basically you have something you want to test and you find groups that can correlate basically with the test group. So let's say if you have a country, let's say you want to compare a campaign in Germany and you're taking France, Italy and the UK 
as control groups, you can do this, but you have to understand what the correlation before was, meaning like how, how have they behaving in the past on a neutral basis, let's say no campaigns at all at the moment, what was the organic baseline, for example, or similar campaigns, similar spends before, what was the correlation? And then you also have to understand, are there any seasonalities? Are there other things you have to factor in? So you're building your model around this, and then you would say, okay, now I'm launching a campaign in Germany, but not in the other countries, and I'm comparing this against. This is actually something very, it sounds very simple. The problem I think here is, or the major problem is time. You want to do this fast, right? You don't want to do something that you're analyzing for months or years, right? You want to analyze something over days and weeks, and then you want to take action because you're planning your budgets at least on a monthly basis. At least that's how it's been in the past. And now suddenly you're there and you need to iterate, you need to get results. And we all know that there are campaigns that can create short-term impact and there are campaigns that are creating long-term impact. Yeah, Just if you think about attribution windows, is it 24 hours, is it seven days, is it 30 days attribution windows? Yeah. Why do we have these attribution windows? Because depending on the app product, we are thinking that certain actions take place only after certain times. So for example, travel, okay, I've seen the travel app, I've engaged with the app, and ultimately I'm booking 14 days later. Yeah? Um, shopping can be very spontaneous. Yeah. Food delivery can be very spontaneous. A game, maybe in a purchase can be very spontaneous, but uh, maybe like registering on a finance app, maybe that takes again longer. So we don't know exactly. Yeah? Or making purchases um, for uh, daily item versus maybe shopping for fashion. Yeah, Maybe for fashion, I also need more time to see the collections and make up my mind. Yeah? So you have different time frames of conversion, Right? And if you think about these models, how do you actually build a system or how do, you, how do you create a system for yourself? And advertisers will have to do this for themselves because every advertiser has sort of like different products, work with different channels, right? So you have to find a mechanism where you can find, where, we can, where you can create a treatment and control group or treatment and control groups that you can compare against each other. And then you have to find a modus operandi where you say, okay, what are my baselines? Which channels do I test and how do I test them, right? Because you cannot only test um, one channel and then another one, but maybe you're testing several channels at once, yeah? So uh, it's like you're sending 10 people out to the field, right, for four hours. Yeah, and then you would say, okay, if I let that person number two work three hours longer, um, how much more output would that give me, right? Because you have to pay by hour, yeah? And then you say, okay, now I'm scaling that person back to the four hours, and then I'm scaling up another person. You're comparing this, yeah? It's a little bit like this, yeah? And now, uh, if you if you think about um, your mobile advertising, I mean, you have tons of channels you're deploying, right? Uh, so you have the Suns, you have programmatic players, you have ad networks, right? So how do you basically generate a, uh, a setup where you would be able to tune it up and down and understand the impact as well? Because you are the only ones that can measure the impact on the back end. So what I'm saying is we're taking all the tracking out. You disregard all the tracking. You disregard the chaos of Ask Ad Network. You're just saying what I put out in, in, in the front. Yeah. And when they do their job and I give them money, they do their job. They put the ads out for me and the target users. Does it give me actual revenues and profits on the back end? Right? Because that's only what counts. That's true incrementality. And that true incrementality is not dependent on measurement. It's, it, what matters is what your channels are doing for you in the front end. And it needs to show on the back end, right? Um, this chart I was basically putting up because uh, we do not have only mobile advertising. We have advertising on, on the web or you have out of home, we have connected TV, we have print, we have tons of different channels, right? And they all play together. And also this is something I have not really seen uh, from any of uh, our advertiser clients in the past. Nobody tackles this really comprehensively because I think everybody has been settling on the last quick attribution world because it's comfortable, it's fast, it's kind of like, you know, you can take fast action, you have something to show, but it's not, it's not been measuring true incrementality. We have kind of been settling with a compromise. Yeah? And I think it's understandable because I was just mentioning there's also uh, a challenge of timing, challenge of complexity because Anybody who wants to do true incrementality testing at scale for all the channels needs to set this up at once. So there will be significant labor involved to do this. Once it's done and the system is up, I think it creates a lot of benefits because you will truly understand how your budgets are performing. Right, now we're coming to this part, which is actually uh, how to look at audience engagement and targeting strategies. Um, by the way, uh, the poll has run through. James, I don't know if you can give me like something like how much yes, how much no proportion. 
Don't see the poll. Yep, sure. So uh, have you done an incrementality test on that audience it's in the last six months as one of your channel partners was the question. And the answer is 18% yes and 82% no. All right, good. So uh, let me just comment on this one. So whoever hasn't done a test, um, there's some logic. So I don't know why you guys have not done a test. Maybe you didn't have time. Maybe you felt it was too early. Yeah, maybe there was no need to do it right now, right? But on the other hand, I've just been mentioning, and you know this as well, when you just listen around and, and you read about the still ongoing um, preparations, people are not ready. LAT traffic is not even yet available at scale, right? It's somewhat available, which means if you really want to test, um, you actually got to wait until it rolls out. You got to see whether your suppliers are ready or whether programmatic supply is ready per se so that actually LAT campaigns can scale. And also the CPMs will level, right? Before that, it was a niche audience. Nobody wanted to bid on it. CPMs were low. So what I'm saying is that, I mean, we've seen in, in the media, like a lot of drums being played around testing and successes in LAT testing. I think I saw things as early as September last year. And September last year, I mean, nothing was there, right? Nothing, SKF network, nothing was there. So how do you even test on LAT? And when digging deeper, I started to understand that um, some advertisers were testing and they were using finger fingerprinting. So they were targeting niche LAT audiences with cheap CPMs and then using fingerprinting to understand based on old style device ID based uh, methodologies, whether they would be creating an uplift. And of course, these results are meaningless because again, CPM prices that you had maybe last year will not prevail. They will go up and they will level or even become more expensive, right? Because maybe in the future, we have actually more campaigns than right now to engage iOS users. And then um, if you really want to understand whether there's incrementality, you cannot rely on fingerprinting or anything that is kind of like mirroring the device ID because in LT, we do not have a device ID. So having said that, I was just interested to understand, but uh, be ready to test again. Um, based on true incrementality models that would work for LAT once the rollout is actually happening and supply is available at scale and users have also in their majority, if at all, moved into LAT. Right, I was saying, sorry, I was missing the joke. I was saying like, okay, what can we do? You can hire Ronaldo, right? So that's one strategy. Then you're getting attention, right? And what I found really sweet on this ad uh, thanks, Shopee, for borrowing this. Uh, um, it says Cristiano Ronaldo, international football player. Right, so that's really sweet because these ads were running in SEA. And maybe somebody needed to know that Ronaldo is a football player, but yes. Anyway, here he is. Um, but the main message about this ad is actually the following. This is an ad that could be a UA ad, that could be a re-engagement ad, that could be a branding ad, could be any of it, right? Um, it has its trigger. I mean, it says 99 Super Shopping Day, right? It has its appeal. Of course, in this case, it's a celebrity. I know not everybody can hire a celebrity, especially not Ronaldo. But um, what I'm saying is this ad works in any of the directions. And this is the world that we're looking at. If we have LAT, we don't know, is this somebody who has the app installed? Somebody I'm, I'm acquiring, I'm re-engaging? Yeah, or will I just have a branding impact on that person, right? But this is the way how we should think about creative innovation. We should make ads more versatile so they can address all of these people because every impression that goes out is potentially addressing any of those use cases. Yeah. Um, what I also want to stress is the following when we think about bringing ads out. Yeah. And this is a nice quote I'm um, borrowing again uh, from the late Bill Bernbach. Um, Nobody counts the number of ads you run. They just remember the impression you make. It is incredibly important. Yeah. Especially when we think about um, Apple enabling view through. So before that view through attribution was not being enabled, now it's enabled, but then there's no real clarity about how well it can be measured, et cetera, et cetera. But I think what we know is the following as well. We have a lot of different ad formats out there. Um, and we also know that users felt spammed with ads before, right? So this was one of the allergic reactions they had. Okay, I'm getting spammed and then I don't even like the ads and then they seem to follow me on top of that, right? So we have to make good impressions in the future as advertisers. This is one of the core uh, initiatives I think we should undertake, make advertising much more attractive again, right? And this goes along with quantity doesn't count as much as quality, right? So does it count that I'm shooting out 10 of these small banner impressions out to users and they're all the same and it's kind of boring and it's kind of repetitive, yeah? Or should I focus on designing, let's say, freer creators, maybe larger, more engaging, interactive formats to make sure I make an impression on the user, right? Because as we know, branding works, right? Um, 
and branding also leads to UA or engagement. Yeah. So again, it's all in one and we have to make good impressions in the future. Um, some, uh, one format also just wanted to show a little bit of data here. I mean, one format that is of course on the rise is video. Uh, video in the past used to be like more niche format, extremely expensive, etc. But now, I mean, as more video inventory is available, more budgets are going into video and video is more engaging. Yeah? And of course, uh, if you think about TikTok, which is just videos, short videos, right? I mean, people love this, right? Uh, they love short videos. Um, they love to be entertained. Yeah. And it's a much more uh, beneficiary uh, ad format than something that is simply static, no? Right. Uh, I just wanted to show this one as well as an example, because um, Right, this, this I came across recently. And um, I think, one moment, I think I skipped this one now. Yeah, we are here. Yeah, and I just wanted to show this. So we don't only have video, we have also many, many ways how we can make creatives animated, right? So let's say, uh, don't just put out the, the static creative and all sizes, uh, make something like a GIF or something that moves or something that tells you something, right? So uh, that it can become part of the content and people can enjoy it as well. No? I think this is the best way how to go out and make every impression worth its time. No? Now, in terms of more pragmatic strategies, yeah. So, okay, we're losing most of our deterministic tracking. Like we're losing all the information that was attached to device IDs. Now, in the next, let's say in the next months, how do we deal with this while we are, let's say, thinking about is SCAT network getting better or uh, can I implement within my own team or within my own company advertiser? Can I implement something like more sophisticated incrementality measurement that takes into consideration impact. Um, in the meantime, what you can do is we can derive information from users that are still available via the device ID. So we call this extrapolation strategies from non lat audiences. Yeah, And this is actually for both iOS and Android because in Android, you also have an LAT audience. It's just comparatively small. Yeah? So in iOS, the audiences, the LAT audience is going to be larger, but there's still go probably going to be uh, an audience that we can deterministically uh, analyze. And then we can see, I mean, from that part of the audience, how are users behaving, how are they performing? And I can extrapolate this into LAT audiences. How can I extrapolate this? Well, I can only extrapolate it through supply signals, yeah? which means I'm building something like supply lookalikes, where I would say um, this, this type of combination is working out well for me. And I will try to target it similarly. Uh, I will try to target similar inventory on uh, LAT. Yeah? So this is not fingerprinting, it's more like a more granular supply targeting. So we're we certainly using models today that are analyzing supply performance like uh, CTR or conversion rate performance on supply, etc. which formats and so on. So we have all this information already, but um, I think this type of extrapolation we haven't done yet because it's very specific to campaigns and audiences that I need to address from advertisers versus a broad analysis of the supply quality that we're receiving through programmatic. No? What needs to happen actually to make this much better? And what needs to happen actually, let's say, imagine everybody in iOS went invisible and there was only LRT and I cannot extrapolate. I mean, I may, maybe I can still extrapolate from Android. Yeah, so I can say, okay, this is how in Android the audiences work. And this is maybe how I then should target the supply as well on iOS. But let's say maybe Android also device IDs disappear. I mean, we're fully reliant on supply signals, right? And supply signals, I mean, there are many, many parameters that can be passed today in a bid request from a publisher, but very few of these signals are homogeneous and are truly being used for more sophisticated targeting. Yeah? So what we need to do and what supply or what publishers need to do to help the ad tech ecosystem to basically analyze the supply quality better and use this more for targeting, where then we are talking not about deterministically following users, but actually making sure I'm buying the right impressions, right? So it's more like session-based. Um, the, the publishers need to make more supply signals available to us than they're doing now. So this is a work they have to do. I've asked around a little bit, but so far it doesn't seem that, every, that, that anybody has moved in big steps. So I guess 
the uh, the rollout of IS 14.5 and ITT needs to happen first. And then we'll slowly, gradually move into a stage where probably the information in the first place will be more homogeneous. So that means instead of five to 10 to 15 data points that we're using today that are maybe homogeneous, maybe we're getting like 20, 25, 30 data points that are already existing just in a homogeneous matter so I can use them for targeting. Yeah, and in the future, maybe we're adding more qualitative information about the impression and in which context the impression can be found. Because I think everybody speaks about contextual data, but when we go deep, and we try to understand how much contextual data is there actually, it's still very superficial. All right, so just to wrap this up, um, I would advise everybody take a step back, right? I think, uh, I think everybody has been in this uh, for months and months in tons of webinars and tons of presentations, everybody how to implement Escape Network and so on, do your homework, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, let's take a step back, uh, let's lose the panic right, and think about advertising and what is in the core of advertising, what makes advertising really, really good, what are the goals of your brand, we all have a brand, every app is a brand, it's not just a product, there's also a brand there, no, um, how do we bring this into the forefront, how do we make it attractive and memorable, right, um, then understanding the impact of iOS 14 and LAT on particularly your business versus like the whole world, because maybe you find out that you can tweak it, kind of like iterate on it, right, for your own business, to minimize impact or to find new solutions for your business as well, right? Then evaluate measurement options, yeah? So keep in mind the measurement options that you knew from the past will not work in the future, except if you blindly follow SK Ad Network and everything that comes out of there. But I think it seems to be clear that you probably won't be able to rely on it, right? Because as you see, it's too complex, it's too unready, right? And it bears a lot of risk, respective fraud. Yeah? Then test. Media max optimizations with your channel partners. So you need on one hand your channel partners to collaborate, but you also need yourself to collaborate in the sense of you need to set up a system that enables you to do this A-B testing, the, setting up these control groups, checking backend data and doing this over and over again in a simplified manner. So if you don't find a setup where you can do this fast and simple, you won't do it, right? You will say, oh, God, too tedious, you know, let's just go for, I don't know, for the big ones, Facebook or Google and so on and so on. Yeah, but you will lose out on all the other opportunities you have and you're actually also not even measuring Google and Facebook properly, right? So you wanna think about how you are testing your media mix properly so you are uh, basically ready for long-term success yeah get creative when thinking about addressing your users yeah these users are consumers yeah and we should all be thinking consumers first advertising was maybe not thinking consumers first they were thinking advertisers first getting out there first hammering down on users with as many impressions as possible right and that's not what we should do and this is a good moment to basically change the way how we operate right and becoming more creative again and ultimately making advertising much more enjoyable for our consumers. And that means to make a lasting impression for your brand um, that helps you to drive long-term value for both the consumer as well as your company. So thank you very much for paying attention um, and for joining the session. Um, please do not miss uh, our Dr. Revex offering, which is basically that we are offering uh, a health checkup for your app. So um, this is a full scale, um, a full scale session about anything you need to understand about your app, how you've been running campaigns, anything where we can advise, share opinions. Um, we would be honored to be part also of the mentioned setup. So if you if you went into like um, uh, setting up something like proper media mix incrementality measurement uh, setup we would be honored to be part of that and to test with you as well so let us know and uh, yeah again thank you very much for joining the session okay thanks Marcia. maybe you want to stop your screen share let's do we've got a question here so irina dan is asking are clients going to start receiving two kinds of reports depending on whether the attribution was done with device IDs or without? Two types of different reports, whether the attribution was done with device ID or not. In terms, okay, I'm trying to understand the question. So if you have a, a user that is there with his or her device ID, it's a de deterministic last click attribution which basically your current MMP is just measuring for you as before. If it's a LAT user, then measurement will come through SKAD network with all the barriers that have been mentioned. That means delay, 
uh, depending on which events you have defined of the 63, basically, and how the user is moving along to basically hit one or the other events, right? So in theory, I mean, if you really had 63 events and one user was moving from one to the other after almost 24 hours, and there was always a 24 hour delay, in theory, it, become, it could become 63 days. Of course, everybody's working uh, around that to make sure that they get information faster. So I think everybody's reducing the amount of the events to the most useful ones that need to be measured to get data fast and ideally to not get the zero, but, uh, which is the in-store, but to get another data point because this other data point will most likely tell the advertiser, okay, this user was real, has done some action. There was more power in this campaign because this campaign brought the user until let's say event number three or four versus uh, somebody else bringing it just until event number one, yeah? Um, hopefully that answers your question, Irina. So how are you finding that uh, clients are dealing with this uh, big change in the ecosystem, Melcher, and how uh, how how are they how are they adapting? Um, do you think they're sort of ready for it for it now, or has there been an acceleration? How how are how are different clients approaching it? Yeah, so I have to say, so Revex is uh, not as much exposed than maybe uh, other ad tech vendors that are operating in the majority, for example, in the US. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So our global exposure is probably only half of that of the average. So we, we certainly potentially impact it because of iOS if those budgets were going to disappear. Um, but um, we're much more relaxed right? and we're just trying to think around solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and then if I think about the advertisers that have a larger share of iOS, many of them are, uh, I would say, they're kind of frozen, they're kind of waiting. Right, so that some I, I heard about some testing. I interviewed them about the, those tests, which is where I got more insights what they were testing actually, and which type of results they were getting. Which is why I was highlighting that most of these tests are invalid tests. Um, but uh, in general, I, I feel everybody's waiting a little bit to see the impact. So it's a little bit like, like the before and after, right? So if I keep everything the same, do I get the same result? Question mark. And actually, it's not measurable because um, once you get LAT, you don't get the standard response of last click. So you need to measure impact. So how do you measure impact suddenly if you don't have any system set up for that part of the budget? So you need to move uh, into a different um, setup for incrementality measurement. Otherwise you start spending blind. And I've heard even that some advertisers say, okay, we just will start, we will just be spending blindly because we have to be in the market, right? Um, that again, opens the doors for <laughs> lots of fraud and inefficiencies in the system. No? Good. So, well, I think uh, that's that's great. So we've got the app uh, doctor uh, out checkup link in the, the chat. Doctor Revex. That's right. And uh, your site is at revex.com. Dot io. Revex.io. Great. And I pasted your email. Um, I guess you're on LinkedIn. Uh, awesome. Yeah, wanna... My inbox is open. Great. I mean, yeah, <laughs> we had some some great feedback on the session. People, someone said it was a, the best one so far, and. Uh, I'm not sure how many we've had. It's probably 35 sessions at this point. So it's, it's direct from London, as you can see. Yeah, <laughs> great. And uh, good. Well, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, yeah, you, James, to, for having to us. see you soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.